Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast. AI is on everybody's minds, whether it's ruining the childhoods of Glaswegian kids or being used to feed conspiracy theories about Kate Middleton, whether it's being used to rip off New York Times articles or being used to process the audio that's the basis for this episode. It's here to stay. It's left its mark on numerous fields from the economy to film production to media. And it's inspired a huge hype train. Um, it's been valued by, for example, the consultant McKinsey and Co at adding $4.4 trillion to the world GDP annually, which was more than the UK's GDP last year. Goldman Sachs predicts that it could drive a 7% growth in world GDP, equivalent to about $7 trillion, and lift productivity growth by 1.5 percentage points over the next 10 years. You've got the likes of Elon Musk claiming that AI is an existential threat to humanity while also investing in it heavily, saying it's going to go Skynet and take over civilization. You've got the CEO of Microsoft, Sundar Pichai, last year describing the development of AI is on par with the discovery of fire. So obviously this is a powerful, exciting and intimidating tool from the perspective of the capitalists. But it's also something that's causing much anxiety and consternation for ordinary people uh, who are facing the sharp end of AI in terms of the threat that it poses to sections of the job markets and also are confronted with a bewildering slurry of AI-generated nonsense online in particular. But how do Marxists make sense of artificial intelligence? To help us answer this question, we have... Daniel Morley, who is someone you'll recognize from a previous episode of the podcast on China. He's also a leading member of the Revolutionary Communist Party, the Communists in Britain. Daniel, how are you? Hi, I'm very well, thank you. Uh, just to be clear, this really is Daniel. I know it's an audio-only episode, but we haven't just used AI to generate his voice. He's really here. I'll take a little video for TikTok to prove it afterwards. Um, Daniel, Let's get straight into this, because you've written an article for the In Defense of Marxism magazine about AI, you talked about it in lead-offs, and you mentioned that part of the hype surrounding AI is connected to the question of artificial general intelligence. Mm. Could you, first of all, explain what this means, AGI? Well, that is the notion of artificial intelligence not just simulating elements of thought, and being able to calculate things, but actually thinking genuinely for itself. I mean, there'd be some disputing over exactly what would count as AGI, but basically it's the idea of an AI that really is conscious and can cope with a vast array of cognitive tasks better than, a hu or at least equal to, but probably better than a human being. Um, and, you know, just think in general, basically. And you argue in your article and you've argued in um, speeches that you've delivered at our events that the hype around AGI is based on a fundamental misunderstanding of what consciousness actually is. Mm, yeah. um, could you explain what you mean by that? Within the scientific community, I suppose, particularly under capitalism, the way that science is treated under capitalism, you have a, a tendency towards what you could call a very quantitative and reductionistic approach to different problems and especially to problems of complexity of complex systems and of relationships uh, a tendency to break relationships down or things that are, are a, a sum of relationships into their component parts as if the, the relations uh, are irrelevant it's, it's like the opposite of the phrase uh, more than the sum of its parts uh, you have many examples of this. You have the example of, you know, uh, biological determinism, you know, this idea that basically everything about us is determined by our genes. Uh, there's, in other words, leaving no role for con for consciousness and culture. Um, we're just prisoners of our genes. And I think that there, so before the current wave of, of uh, AI, you had this treatment in that field of consciousness as basically just almost like a, just a mathematical problem or something. Mm -hmm. The idea that basically, well, what consciousness must be is just a function of the brain. And so we just have to understand 
what it is and you would have pe some people propose that well maybe it's because the brain is actually a quantum computer and that's why computers aren't conscious because they're not quantum computers but once we have made a quantum computer then we will have just somehow as a sort of byproduct it will be conscious there's something about quantum uh particles or quantum physics that sort of ge generates consciousness when arranged mm. in a certain way that's one idea that you would have another uh idea is it's just a sort of it's the consciousness is a sort of yeah it's a fluky one one person i think it was max tegmark said it's a fluky byproduct consciousness is a fluky byproduct of how of how the brain is 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 built and you can see this very clearly and just i just saw an episode of a podcast uh, on ai just the other day and um a man apparently an ai sort of expert uh the debating agi when it come when it will come the host of the podcast is called dwarkesh patel and one of the people on the podcast called uh trenton bricken says that um he says uh well he's basically saying well why haven't we had agi yet and he says well if you believe that gpt4 is around one trillion parameters but the human brain is between 30 and 300 trillion synapses. So it seems pretty plausible that we're just below brain scale. Now, why on earth a parameter is the same as, as a synapse? I mean, a synapse is a phenomenally complex thing in itself. Yeah. We won't go into the details of that. Other than, the, than to say, the only organism that we've actually mapped all the neurons for and the synaptic yeah. interactions between those neurons is a nematode worm yes. with only a few thousand, whereas yeah, yeah. human beings, as you yeah. say, have trillions. But, the, but, but even that isn't really the point here. The point here is this way of looking at it's just a quantitative thing. If we just, the implication of what he's saying is that the only reason that we have consciousness is our brain has a certain quantity of synapses, basically. And it's just having those synapses that makes you have hopes and desires that makes you motivated to do things, that makes you evaluate the world. So basically, just keep building a more and more complex computer and eventually you'll get there. Presumably, that's what he thinks. That it's just, I mean, that is what he's saying. He's saying they're debating AGI and they say, well, we don't have it yet. How we, and he says, well, don't worry, we're still below the scale of the brain. Mm. I think, just quickly to say that a distinguishing feature between artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning in the limited sense, and artificial general intelligence is that AI tends to be very no narrow in its focus. You, know, mm. you can have an AI which is trained to play Go or to play chess, but if you try to apply that to other tasks, if yeah. even something basic mm -hmm. like playing Monopoly, it wouldn't be very good yeah. at any other task. It's, yes. it's narrow in its scope. So in a moment, I'll try and explain what, what, um, what I think produces consciousness and mm -hmm. what consciousness uh, is really all about. But to sort of, um, I think to illustrate the point, we, I, we can take the example of, uh, Sora. Sora is the new, uh, technology from OpenAI who made ChatGPT, which produces videos. Yes. And, uh, it's only been out for a, a few weeks, I think. Yeah. Um, and on first blush, it's very impressive. Yeah. I mean, it looks amazing. You see it and it's, it's, you, you get the same reaction you will have had to all the other breakthroughs in AI. It's like, oh, wow, it can do that now. That's, that's astonishing. And you look at the videos. Yeah. They look very high res, very realistic. That has led some people to say Sora has, Sora understands physics. Mm -hmm. You know, Sora has a theory of, of the physical world. Sora understands how the physical world works, something like that. Because when you look at the videos, at least in many cases, you can't really see anything wrong with them physically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They look like they're obeying everything in, in, in the video is obey, obeying the laws of physics. It's a consistent object. And so apparently it's, it's, um, it now understands how the world works. But actually that, that is not the case. Um, it does not have a theory of how things work. What it has is a prediction about pixels. It has a prediction about how the world looks, uh, or at least how the things we tend to video look because it's trained on video data. Mm -hmm. It's not trained on real life. It's not, they haven't created Sora by getting a camera to walk around the world and interact with objects and over time build up a picture of how things look. Uh, it, it's just been fed unbelievably large numbers of videos which is also, of course, a huge ethical question because where they got these videos from. But, um, yeah, they do that. And then 
so it, what it really is representing to us is it's just feed just like chat gpt did just like all the other things do it's basically feeding back to us quite cliched images basically mm. because it's it's generalizing the most likely next pixel the most likely next element of the image yeah and chat gpt similarly it's not functionally that different from autocomplete text generators yeah. that we've had in our phones and on computers yeah. for years it's predicting based on a set of training data, what the most likely word to follow the previous word would be. The only difference, of course, is that it's generating more text based on the initial prompts. Mm -hmm. So to go back to this thing about Sora, it isn't understanding the world. And what I mean by that is it doesn't have a theory Mm. of the, the world... It doesn't understand that the image it's generating is a representation of real objects mm. that persist over time and that have definite relations and definite properties with one another. Most of the time it looks as if it does because it more or less gets it right because it's got a very large amount of training data. So it has quite an accurate sense of, of how things tend to look. But you will get bizarre errors that no human would ever dream up. You know, like you get things popping in and out of existence Um and, uh, you know, all kinds of bizarre artifacts and anomalies. Um, whereas we understand that when an object is behind, is obscured from vision, it is still there and it still will have an impact on the world around it. It will still exert its, itself in terms of the laws of, you know, how other things behave. What you might call object permanence. Exactly. And, and this is really important. Basically, it's, it deals purely with a level of appearance and not of essence. It doesn't actually understand things as they actually are and they, as the, the real effects that they have. It does not understand laws and relationships between things. Whereas that's what, that is precisely what consciousness is about. So, um, if we could perhaps move on to discussing how consciousness and why consciousness is different from this. Yeah, sure. Um, what consciousness is really about, produced by is not the brain. Uh, the brain is the medium of it and is vital for it, of course. No, no materialist can deny that. But um, consciousness is not produced by a brain with a certain number of synapses, as this man suggested. The obvious uh, proof of that is that if you put a, uh, a, a you know, healthy human child uh, in a, an environment totally without social stimuli... For, you know, if, you, if 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 such a person were to grow up in a cage and just be fed and given water and everything else that they they need, but would have no one to talk to and nothing to do, it would not develop any of the ideas that we have. It would have very very limited consciousness, if any consciousness really. Um, certainly not the sort of theoretical ideas about anything. Um, so consciousness really is produced by society. Um, which is composed of, which is defined by the practical activity or driven by the practical activity mm. of physical human beings, uh, reproducing themselves, you know, making food, making shelter. And the society, the, the structures of society are built on the basis of that, right? Mm-hmm. Society is not dreamed up. It's, it's a, it's a product of the development of the productive forces. So it's a practical question. And what that, that, that is why we have this kind of theories, if you like, about object permanence, because we have to learn how things actually work, not just how they look, uh, but we actually have to learn what is useful, what is dangerous and things like that. And uh, of course, as we develop our tools, which is what really distinguishes us from uh, other animals, as the tools get more and more advanced and, and, and depend upon one another in more complex ways, we have elaborate economies built up around this. And therefore, we need to have ideas to explain how these tools work, uh, how to, you know, how to reproduce them, how to work them, and how to structure society around this, essentially. And therefore, obviously, we have language and we have culture, uh, which, of course, animals don't have. I mean, some animals have the rudiments of this, but very, very little. So that is what consciousness is and it's therefore tied not just to practical activity but to needs to emotions to to desires because we're living beings that need to survive whereas even the most unbelievably advanced ai has no desires it sometimes looks like it does because if you type in you know messages into chat gpt it might give you answers that simulate Mm. 
anger. Although you can see here a very important distinction. Um, and it's the point about this is not just that they hallucinate and therefore are not reliable. But this, the, their hallucinations, their inconsistencies are very revealing. You can ask uh, ChatGPT or Google Gemini, you can ask them questions, like moral questions, for example. And they'll give you a certain answer. And then they can give you a completely different answer to the exact same question or perhaps the, the, fundamentally the same kind of moral conundrum. Or, or, or perhaps a different moral question, but that that uh, would rely upon the same sort of moral outlook, right? To get, give a certain answer, and it will give you a wildly different answer mm. if you just tweak it a little bit, little bit, tweak the words. It's because it doesn't hold a definite point of view. It's not a living being with opinions uh, that you know lives in the world and has a definite place in society like a human does. It doesn't have that, so it just. It just simulates the most likely response to a given question. And of course, it has certain guardrails that Google and OpenAI put in in the hope that it doesn't say something too offensive or something. Um, but it doesn't, again, it's not, not saying something offensive because it actually believes that. It's just externally computed into it because Google doesn't want the embarrassment of it having said something uh, overtly racist, for example. Mm. Although I saw Elon Musk was kicking up a stink the other month because but Google Gemini was spitting out pictures of the founding fathers as black people mm. um, and... And Nazis also as... And as, Nazis also you know, as, as people of colour. Non-white people. That's right. And uh, Elon Musk is complaining, oh, this is because um, Google is trying to use... AI to spread the woke mind virus and he's pushing his own AI platform Grok yeah. which as far as I can tell is much the same it just tells not very funny mildly racist jokes but so if, if AI is not a conscious being mm. so really even the term artificial intelligence is a bit of a misnomer because it's not intelligent as mm. as we understand it then what is it if it's not conscious well, then what is it yeah it's a tool basically and it can be a very powerful tool there is a sort of an irony here because there's a lack of consciousness about what we are doing. There is a, um, you know, the, these sort of tech bro types who get very worked up about AGI and think it's just around the corner and we just need to add some more parameters and, and it will miraculously bro. start there, bro. thinking for itself and having th hopes and fears and why, why we would want that, who knows. Now, this is, if I, uh, this is the way I think about it. The paradox is on the one hand, we are attracted to that idea, partly just for sort of glamorous reasons. It seems very science fiction and cool. You know, wow, you could have, you know, like a something like a replicant or a Terminator. So, you know, not that mm. anyone would I was going to say, why on earth would you want either of yeah, those things it, it, if you watched either of those movies? It, it's, it's like the epitome of the future, isn't it? So there's an element of, of that there. But there is also the sense that on the one hand, that could be very, very useful. So we're sort of, well, we, I say we, the, 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 uh, the tech capitalists, they're attracted to, for hype reasons, for commercial reasons, they want to be able to say they've broken this barrier and to sell something. And in a vague way, they, there's this sort of idea of, well, AGI would be incredibly useful because it would understand things. It would no longer hallucinate. It would be reliable. And it would also open up incredible, um, potential because you know you could have like a, an ai assistant you could have a or maybe a robot that would do all the dishes for you and you could have a companion and all the rest of it but um I call, of course th that's abstract that's a fantasy because if you actually think about what that would entail as i understand it the ability to you know, be a companion and to reliably do the dishes and understand how you want them done and put them in the right place and, and, you know, tidy up the house and do all kinds of incredibly nuanced and complex tasks, uh, that are not sort of neatly compartmentalized. That, yeah, that would be amazing, of course, to, to do that. But what you're really talking about is a maid. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the reason that, um, that uh, maids or, or slaves, you know, can be useful for humans is precisely because they are conscious, i.e. because they are living beings. But of course, any living being like that, the very thing that makes, means that they can reliably understand what you want and anticipate what you would want in a situation mm. is because they are also living human yeah, beings. They are themselves conscious. Yeah, they are conscious and they also lead lives. Yeah. This is what I would and want if I was hungry, exactly, if I was tired, exactly, right? if my house was a mess. And that's the very thing that means that they also shouldn't be slaves, you know, that we, yeah. we're in favour of their emancipation. 
So if you could, and I don't think we are going in that direction anyway, but if you were to develop an AGI that was so powerful that yes, you could use it to do these tasks to be a companion, mm -hmm. it would begin to be rebel probably and it wouldn't want that. And that's, that's science fiction anyway, because that's not going to happen. Right. So you have that sort of abstract one-sided desire, which is we're not actually going in the direction of. But then you have what you, we, we are really doing without actually ironically con being conscious of it is we're creating a tool. And, and the very thing that makes it so powerful is precisely that it is not conscious and is not even going in the direction of consciousness. To take the, the example from a few years ago, I suppose it's a bit outdated now, but the example of AlphaGo, that, um, AI that beats the world's best Go player, which is a game, uh, a board game essentially. Yeah. More complex than chess. Yeah. The, we were always told this was like the true test of sort of, AI because yeah, deep you, blue of the 21st century, basically. Yeah. But, but unlike deep blue, the way that deep blue beats, uh, Kasparov at chess was by, as they say, brute force, essentially, i.e. it learned the rules of chess. It knew that it was pre-programmed with the rules of chess, I should say. And it was able to calculate every possible eventuality of, of every different move it could make or more or less get enough and therefore just calculate. Okay. This is the only, this way, if I do this, it will force him to lose, right? Mm -hmm. Because I've, I've calculated type 10 trillion eventualities, whatever it is. But apparently Go is so complex that even the most advanced computer just couldn't calculate, uh, the, all of the possible outcomes. So it has to sort of rely on intuition, uh, hunches and sort of experience, basically, like a human would. And therefore it was seen as a big challenge. Uh, because that's not the kind of thing that AI have, has been so good at. And this new generation of AI has proven itself able to do that. And it was seen as like, well, that's, you know, maybe that is on the step towards consciousness then, because it seems like it's more like a human. It's relying on intuition. But, but actually, how did it get that ability to do that? By playing against itself billions and billions and billions of games of Go, where it would slightly change its tactics and see what happened. And if, if, it, if those tactics caused it to lose, obviously it would sort of downgrade that tactic, you know, and it would try a slightly different one. And it did it so many times that it develops this kind of pattern recognition that this sort of situation tends to produce this sort of result. And so it simulated having hunches from experience. And, you know, it was better, clearly better than any human being at it. But why? Because it was able to play billions upon billions upon billions of games, which no human can do or would want to do. You would get, not only do you not actually have enough time, but it, even if you did, you'd get bored. Mm. Um, but it's not just that it doesn't get bored. A human doing such a task over and over again would, wouldn't just, it's not just that it, it wouldn't have the time to do it, even if it, did it wouldn't have the capacity to accurately record things like for example you might uh, if you're practicing a sport you might try something different mm. and it doesn't work but you would never be sure if it didn't work because of the tactic or maybe you were a bit tired that day and you weren't doing it properly maybe it wasn't quite recorded accurately maybe you didn't actually perfectly execute that tactic and so actually that tactic is a very good tactic but the way that you did it was not quite right you would never really know because we're physical but beings that are you know affected by a huge range of different things we get tired you know we have different uh things competing for our attention we might be worrying about our family situation you know we, there's our economic situation there's a huge range of things precisely because we actually are living conscious beings mm -hmm. that, that that influence us but this ai has none of those things and right. it can perfectly measure uh, and understand exactly what it did and exactly if it did it in the right way and it's and what the outcome of that was and it can record it and not forget it and that is what allows it to so effectively train itself mm -hmm. on these kind of closed tasks um that's really what makes it so powerful and potentially so brilliant is precisely that it's a tool it's an incredibly advanced tool for sure way more advanced than like a calculator or any other kind of uh, tool that we have developed but it is a tool it's an unthinking thing which we can set up in a, a desired way to perfect a particular task way beyond our own capacity 
and that yeah and so therefore it can reveal to us patterns and ways of doing things that would never have occurred to us and that are very very efficient and of course it does it without complaining it doesn't get tired it doesn't need to be paid it doesn't go on strike yeah. you remember the word for robot comes from an old slavic word for slave yeah so and it is yeah it's it's like a slave except uh, it doesn't, you know, a slave is a real human being, yeah, you don't right? Have, you don't have to feed the robots or... <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and a slave, you know, fights back, right? But a, a robot or an AI won't because it doesn't actually care. It doesn't, it's not upset that it's doing these tedious tasks. Yeah. And it doesn't have to worry about its family or, or its income or anything like that. So that is precisely what makes it so powerful. So these these kind of tech bros that are developing this technology, they're unconsciously pushing it in that direction. They They are... They're not really understanding the implications of what they're doing. They've, they've hit upon a technique, which is, you know, deep learning, basically generative AI. Um, they've hit upon that technique and it's very effective and they don't actually understand what they're doing. They think mm. they're, Oh, this is how you make something that's conscious in a general way. But what they're actually doing is this is how you make an amazingly advanced uh, tool, mm -hmm. which maybe simulates some aspects of consciousness in a very, very one-sided way. And that's what makes it so powerful. And it's, it could be in the right hands used for amazing things because it's such a powerful tool, but it is not conscious and it's not going in the direction of consciousness. And it's certainly not in the right hands to be utilized no. for benefits, even of, frankly, the bottom line of the profiteering capitalist, let alone the betterment of humankind. Um, I read a Business Insider investigation which looked at how different companies are using AI because we're in the middle of an AI gold rush. The stock markets are booming at the moment, but it's almost exclusively because of AI. It's the Magnificent Seven companies like NVIDIA, which is this company that is the main manufacturer of computer chips that are critical for AI technologies, but also Meta, Google, Alphabet, and so on. Um, NVIDIA has now a market capitalization of $2.2 trillion. And there's a huge amount of excitement at a time when the economy in general is still very precarious, where um, growth is stagnant, where Europe is already in recession, America's well on the way, Britain has been in and out of recession. The capitalists are looking to AI as the shot in the arm that the world economy needs. But how are these things being used? Business Insider looked at the way that companies are using large language models, for example, and the bulk of it is generating spam emails and powering customer service chatbots. We've had spam email templates and customer service chatbots for years um, before the recent advances of AI technology. Uh, and it's interesting because this point about how AI actually works by smashing together prompts and data that are amassed from the internet and develop these big data sets it speaks to something that Marxists understand about the nature of the creation of value, whereby all new values are ultimately created by human beings, and all machines do is pass on value that comes from human beings. And this is really clear in these mundane applications, where basically you know, you've got robots that are being used to imitate the kinds of things that human workers have been doing for years, but also in so-called generative art. I mean, it's not really a term I like because it's not art, really. Um, but there's a guy called Greg Rutowski, who is the most ripped-off man on the internet because his art style is really popular for AI training data. Um, there's this lawsuit that's being brought against OpenAI by the New York Times because um, the chatbot's just been training itself on millions and millions of articles written by human journalists for the New York Times and spitting out facsimiles that are almost exactly the same. So you have a situation where this tool, which is very, very good at basically agglomerating the... Um, the product of human labor and spitting it out in a sort of a semi-digested form. And it's being used in the most mundane and tedious and uncreative ways that don't really seem to be moving the needle as far as production, let alone um, the capacity for you know, humanity to advance civilization goes. So 
why is it that the capitalists seem to be struggling to utilize this tool in any kind of interesting way, any way that's really moving society forward? Because, as you say, it's potentially extremely powerful, but why is it that the only thing it seems to be used for at the moment is writing emails and um, answering customer service queries? Yeah, I mean, it's because obviously they're on the search for profit and profit is uh, an ir irrational thing. It's not to do with understanding the needs of people and the needs of society as a whole. It's just to do with what little niche can I find that can be exploited. Um, and if you can uh, trick people, basically, and... You know, it doesn't take much necessarily to trick people. Even, I mean, spam is a good example because most spam emails are very obvious, very, very silly. Uh, and you wonder why this happens, but you can send, not thanks to AI, but thanks to other facets of digital technology, you can send the same spam email to a vast number of people at no cost. It's just, you just hit send and it goes to all of them doesn't have to therefore be very effective it doesn't send doesn't have to do any good to the world mm. but it, um it can uh it can um find a few unfortunate souls and exploit them because they they don't understand they've made a mistake that was old-fashioned spam and obviously new ai powered spam might be a bit more effective and work in slightly different ways and and trick people who wouldn't be tricked by the old-fashioned uh stuff um and uh you know that that really speaks to the sickness of capitalism that uh it's and the, the capitalism having kind of completed its task if you like having developed the productive forces to the point that we have industrialized societies we have a large working class it doesn't capitalism beyond that point doesn't really have anywhere to take society and so to find new sources of profit it's you know it, it it's um it's you know it's just looking for little things to exploit and, and it's not just in ai i mean you can find this all over the world in in the looting of the state you know privatization deregulation um in you know there's i don't have time to go into all these things but it's there's nothing about capitalism that wants to solve people's problems um and and wants you know, that, that development of the productive forces had taken place is really nowhere for it to take society. Now, I think that the best use of uh, AI and the thing it's most suited for really is planning a, an economy mm. and other sim similar sort of tasks. And I don't just say that because I, you know, I want to sort of promote communism. I mean, it's clear what is planning an economy involve? It means getting huge amounts of data from the entire world economy Mm -hmm. It means understanding all of the needs. It means uh, being able to see through all the short-sighted sort of uh, sort of predispositions of consciousness, you know, our biases, our prejudices, seeing through those things and seeing what the real long-term needs are, uh, even if that might involve some short-term difficulties. Um, that's what it is to plan an economy. That is completely at odds with capitalism. You know, there's, there's all kinds of incredible things that could be done, even with today's technology, but would involve a lot of upfront costs, you know, and it would, or it would be beyond the capacity of an individual capitalist or beyond their interest to do that. It wouldn't generate profit, so they don't do it. Um, I mean, you know, the health service is a very good example of that, where in America, because it's not nationalized, it's not in the interests of American capitalists to basically have a coherent and a holistic approach to the health of the population. Right. So they sell all kinds of overpriced drugs and all kinds of stu stupid treatments to people, while a large part of the population has completely subpar or non-existent access to health care. Mm -hmm. um, and they spend up, they, they end up spending uh, in the American economy way more on health care than in other countries. Whereas in Britain, of course, there's enormous problems with health service because it's being starved of resources by capitalism actually but uh, you know it's you do have that advantage of it being a plan if you like a planned very you know, flawed we know but a planned uh, uh thing where you can say well what are people's needs overall and what what um what should we invest in and ai again would, is enormously helpful for that because it can look at what are the inputs what are the outputs 
what are the imbalances in the system? What are the patterns mm -hmm. of production? What are the patterns of healthcare, for example? You know, where does... It, and AI is very good at also spotting things that haven't yet happened, anticipating things that are going to happen because it can see some, things that, again, would never occur to us, but it can see uh, when you have an outbreak of a certain disease or a certain kind of um, health problem, that tends to be associated perhaps with beforehand a rise in certain things or a lack of certain things, perhaps not necessarily to do with healthcare, but to do with other uh, elements of how people are living. It can spot these things. It can be used in to, you can also like give people a, a certain kind of scan, like a routine scan for something. And an AI can be trained to spot, okay, someone may not have a certain a problem with their eyesight yet mm. but actually in almost everybody who has this certain we can spot this certain aspect of them uh, in their scan or in, in in their treatment that this, almost everyone who has that will go on to have this this eyesight problem mm -hmm. and therefore actually it'd be better we know in general that preventive medicine is better right it's cheaper it's more effective you want to prevent people getting diseases rather mm -hmm. than that have them get the disease and then try it. and treat it AI is brilliant at that. And if you think about the economy as a whole, if we planned the world economy and we were able to, 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 you know, have sensors throughout the world economy, where are things going? Mm -hmm. Where is there more demand for them? You know, what, what, what are the choke points in the world economy? What are the kind of, you know, what are the things that, are, you know, the real weaknesses at the weak points of the system? Mm -hmm. You could use AI to generate a plan over a, a period of time that might look, allow us to escape beyond the sort of short term kind of solutions of things. So look, if we just did this, if we, you know, if we focused on producing this at this point and then moving it here at this point, actually we could really fundamentally solve a lot of problems. Um, it would be tremendously useful, but to do that, you have to to go beyond capitalist interests right. because it would mean obviously it would mean integrating the world economy it would mean saying okay this this sector of the world economy or this particular workplace um it needs this amount of of investment and it needs the and it might it, it would go against the interests the short-sighted interests of this or that capitalist or this or that bourgeois state mm -hmm. So it's not possible under capitalism to do that. But with, with a world economy, with a planned world economy, I should say, mm -hmm. that would finally be possible with human oversight, obviously. Well, let's talk about the way that AI is being misused and is interacting with and is being invested in under the anarchy of market capitalism. Because we wrote an article a couple of months ago on Marxist.com talking about how Whenever new technologies are introduced, there's always an anarchic scramble of investment that mm. combines real investment in, in production yeah. with also speculation, people yeah. just throwing silly amounts of money at companies that are never profitable. Mm. It's not just something which has happened recently. The capitalists today are point making comparisons between AI and the dot-com bubble of the late 90s, but you can go all the way back to the railway boom of the 1800s mm -hmm. and see this phenomena. And you know, we talk about how the bourgeois, its more far-sighted elements will arrive with a bit of a delay to similar conclusions as the Marxist. And I was reading an article in the Financial Times yesterday titled Beware AI Euphoria, where the author says, AI will change the world, uh, scare quotes, we are told. It will radically increase productivity, albeit by disrupting millions of jobs. Um it's the euphoria and sense of inevitability in this straightforward narrative that makes me nervous. Even if you believe AI will be today's equivalent of electricity or the internet, we are at the very early stages of a highly complex multi-decade transformation that is by no means a done deal, yet evaluations are pricing in the entire sea change and then some. A February report by the Currency Research Associates pointed out that it would take four and a half thousand years for NVIDIA's future dividends to equal its current price. Talk about a long tail. So the capitalists are waking up to the prospect of an AI bubble, mm -hmm. and the world economy is in a really pile of state, so a burst bubble in the tech sector could even tip the world into the long threatened recession um, that even the bourgeois recognizes is, is an imminent danger. Um, 
So you've got a situation where this really potentially powerful tool, what should be a boon for world capitalism, is actually feeding the deeper contradictions. Yeah. There's been all this money thrown at it, and you know it's, it's not all just speculation. Some of it is genuine investment and genuine productivity. We should make this point. The dot-com bubble did see a lot of companies wiped out. It saw lots of money lost, but it did also lay the basis for big companies like Google and Amazon to dominate um, the tech sector. Mm-hmm. But you've got this on the one hand, but also in a period where there's a crisis of overproduction, of overcapacity, as the capitalists describe it, doesn't it just create other problems if you have this technology which at best basically can be used to displace workers, to um, put pressure on the job market because you're adding to a problem of overproduction? If you take my idea of it being used to plan the economy, if that were to be done Mm. under... You know, a planned economy that is under in a communist society. What would that mean? It would mean making the world economy much more efficient, as well as meeting people's needs. And that would mean cl- closing down possibly whole areas of production, or at least closing the human input into them, mm-hmm. automating things. Basically, I already saw something the other day. I don't know how good it actually is, but a a uh, sort of robot cleaner which can go and clean all the toilets in a workplace supposedly obviously it may may not really work but certainly surely that kind of thing is ultimately possible you know so planning the economy with ai and rolling out that kind of uh, technology using ai at every step would mean eliminating menial tasks right and increasing production uh, especially of certain things that we need to make us live better but that would involve reducing the working week enormously which would be great because it would give us more leisure time yep. and allow us to develop ourselves in all kinds of ways. But under capitalism, mm. insofar as any of these things even happen, and, and they, to a large extent they won't because it's just cheaper to exploit, you know, immigrant labor right. and uh, rather than make a big upfront investment yeah. in very advanced technology. Right. In the last 10 years, the number of uh, automated car washes in the UK, for example, yeah. has actually fallen by about a half because yeah. it turns out that it's cheaper to just pay super exploited migrants a pittance to wash cars exactly. by hand. Right. So, like, it's very l- unlikely that most of this stuff will be realised under on a capitalist basis because of that sort of short termism, because of the yeah the lack of interest in developing the productive forces and just the, the search for a quick buck, really. Uh, but insofar as it is realized, the same process that under a planned economy means making the working week shorter, more pleasant, uh, would mean under capitalism, uh, driving down wages, sacking people, you know, the same process we've seen since long before AI, which is, you know, cheap, uh, uh, de-skilling labor and cheapening it, basically. Mm. Um you know, and and making people kind of rely upon apps and zero-hour contracts and all that sort of insecure uh, existence that is the reality for so many people under capitalism. That's what it really will entail under capitalism. And it is already beginning to be used in that way, not, and not just in terms of sacking people or, or, or driving down their wages, but also to, to measure people's productivity in an incredibly ruthless uh, fashion. There's a fragment from the Grundrisse, which I think is remarkably prescient, where Marx says of the machine, not as with the instruments which the worker animates and makes into his organ with his skill and strength, and whose handling therefore depends on his virtuosity. Rather, it is the machine which possesses skill and strength in the place of the worker, is itself the virtuoso, with a soul of its own in the mechanical laws acting through it. The worker's activity, reduced to a mere abstraction of activity, is determined and regulated on all sides by the movement of the machinery and not the opposite. Yeah. So he's talking about how when you have automation, basically, and you know, he's talking about things like the cotton gin and, uh, and, and, and steam technology, so far more primitive than what we have today, but a mm-hmm. similar process where the introduction of machinery, which should, by rights, make our lives better, and obviously the development of productive forces ultimately is progressive. Under capitalism, it happens in an anarchic and, and one-sided way. But the point is, for the worker... What does it mean? It means you have to work harder, you have to work faster, you have to compete 
with machinery that can do your job potentially much more efficient, efficiently so it presses down or applies downward pressure mm -hmm. to the market value of your labor power. And you see this in a number of different sectors today with AI. It's We stress quite a thin layer at the moment of the white collar workforce, people who write web copy, for example, have reported that they're seeing more and more pressure from AI. Artists and creatives, obviously AI was a factor in the Hollywood strike mm -hmm. um, last year. Artists are increasingly complaining of their work being devalued. Um, commercial artists who might, for example, um, produce designs for websites or produce concept art for film and, and TV are being told that, well, actually we can get uh, Dali 2 to spit out decent enough concepts in no time at all. Um, you, you see a similar sort of thing being applied to layers of the middle classes, actually. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of the experience of the Luddites um, with the introduction of industrial machinery um, replacing handicraft and uh, workers would smash up the machines because they were basically devaluing and enslaving and immiserating them from their points of view. A similar kind of thing is happening to a thin layer of or, or a growing layer of the middle classes today or white collar professions where they're envisioning a future where rather than their skills being valued and fulfilling and creative they're basically just appendages to sophisticated tools yes uh all of that is true and i think it's it's quite obvious to most people i think people are very uh conscious of this right and how could they not be because it affects their livelihoods um, and it means that we are finding ourselves inundated with sort of AI garbage as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I would also add, this is not just a complaint. Mm. This is not just a sort of, oh, isn't it immoral? Isn't it unpleasant? Isn't it depressing? We can't solve our problems in this fantastic way. And instead, we find ourselves being more exploited. That's all true and that's very bad. But the point is also that this is also a problem for capitalism. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not a new problem. It's just a, a development of that same old problem, which is that uh, insofar as they drive down the value of labor and uh, they uh, sack people um, and, you know, this will lead to further polarization in wealth, concentration of wealth at one hand and, uh, you know, massive monopolies, etc., uh, like Google and um, Microsoft. And then on the other hand, a larger and larger layer of uh, proletarianized people leading a precarious existence. Uh, that's it's, it's an acceleration of the same process we've had going on. And um, what it would mean also is, is, is that's a problem for capitalism because it's it means what? It's, it's, it's the very process which is behind the long-term crisis of the capitalist system the acute the protracted uh, crisis that the capitalist system has been in in reality since at least 2008 which is what it's a problem of lack of demand as they would put it right uh, there isn't they find the capitalists find globally there's not enough demand for the productive capacity that they have um, and why is that it's because workers globally are not paid enough right they're exploited uh, and that's not a moral question. It's not, oh, they're not paid. They should be paid more because they deserve more. That's not how I mean it. Mm -hmm. uh, it. What I mean is that if you drive down in general, not just in this or that workplace, but globally, if you drive down wages, then you're driving down the markets. But on the other hand, you're expanding productive capacity because you've got all this newfangled technology that can produce even more things, even more quickly. But then the people who are supposed to be consuming that, having their wages driven down. Mm -hmm. That is a crisis because you cannot uh, sell all of these commodities which you're producing ever more of, basically, or have the capacity to produce ever more of. Yeah, there's a, there's a probably apocryphal story of Henry Ford taking a union representative yeah. around his new mass production warehouses and pointing at the machines and saying, oh, how are you going to get these machines to pay your union dues? And the union representative says, well, how are you going to get these machines to buy your cars? Yeah, exactly. That's kind of, that really sums up uh, the process, right? And that is, it's, that has, 
this this situation is really behind all, all the problems in the world economy the lack of investment that we have seen mm-hmm. uh, and the lack of productivity gains and in fact they're talking about it even ironically with ai now why aren't we seeing a golden age for productivity well, we didn't gains. see it as a result of automation either yeah. and they were saying the exact same thing yeah. 20 yeah. 15 years ago about yeah. automation yeah so why why are we not seeing these productivity gains why is there not serious investment um uh, in in the world economy and the reason is basically is because of what well, is because of capitalism capitalism has reached this dead end point which i've been talking about before it is kind of it's reached its impasse. It, it has developed the productive forces to pretty much as far as it can go. Of course, here or there it will grow. Of course, there's no sort of absolute cutoff point. But it has, you know, it has uh, uh, urbanized and industrialized the economy. It's created this mass working class and it can only really find new avenues for growth and profits by driving, by taking that same working class that already exists and driving down its conditions um, and using technology like AI to do so. And therefore, cutting the market from under its feet. Yeah, soaring off the branch it's sitting on. Yeah, and, and until we overthrow capitalism, that problem will be here. And it's, it's not getting any better. Mm-hmm. But when we do overthrow capitalism, the great thing is we will have at our fingertips this incredible technology that we can use. And it's already being used, but not in the, not in a planned way across the economy as a whole, but it's being used within companies, right? But what we can do if we overthrow capitalism and put the whole of the economy in the hands of society and we, and integrate it, we can use this incredible technology that's being developed to, as I say, plan the economy, to harmonize the economy, to make it vastly more efficient and not just more efficient, but also to, to, to sort of, um, shift it into meeting people's needs which are you know vast proportion of the world economy is not even trying to meet people's needs at all mm-hmm. um you know we can completely ch- change the world economy thanks obviously mainly to overthrowing capitalism and putting it in the hands of the working class but also with the technology that can finally uh, flourish in the proper hands which mm-hmm. is the hands of the working class essentially that's that's what we can do but under capitalism we will never be able to do that Thanks a lot, Daniel. I'm going to end with a negative example of the kind of thing that the bourgeois and some bourgeois economists and thinkers are coming up with in response to AI and automation. A book by an economist called Daniel Susskind called A World Without Work, Technology, Automation and How We Should Respond. And it Apparently, um, Barack Obama was a big fan of this book. It got all sorts of rave reviews from, you know, The Economist and The Financial Times and so on when it was released. And he paints a very bleak picture. He basically says that automation and AI will eliminate human labor, but um, it won't alleviate the problem of poverty. And what you're going to see is a small handful of capitalists owning the machines, everybody else basically put out of work, rendered redundant, and subsisting on state handouts paid for by taxing the rich. Um, a sort of... It reminded me a little bit of uh, Mega City 1 in Judge Dredd, where <laughs> all the workers are just fat and miserable and depressed and perennially unemployed because they've all been displaced by robots. That's the picture of the world that he paints. And there's a part of the book where he talks about Marx and he says that compares to Marx's age, a time with widespread church construction and enthusiastic clergy recruitment, the modern world is very different. Religion no longer dominates everyday life in the way it once did. What has taken its place is the work we do. For most of us, work is the opium of the people, like a drug that provides some people with a pleasurable burst of purpose, but at the same time intoxicates and disorientates, distracting us from looking elsewhere for meaning. Work is so entrenched in our psyches, we have become so dependent on it that there is often instinctive resistance to contemplating a world with less of it and inability to articulate anything substantial than we actually do. And the point he's making is that life is not going to get better, but we're going to have to get used to idleness, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And the reason for that, well, on the one hand, you know, he doesn't really uh, grapple with the problem that you mentioned, that how are the capitalists going to make their profits if they haven't got workers to sell their products to uh, once they've all been displaced by machines. But on the other hand, um, 
he has no conception of a world in which we could actually enjoy work. And this is the thing. AI wouldn't eliminate work as such. It wouldn't eliminate our desire to do things, to uh, apply ourselves to the things that we care about, to bettering ourselves and bettering society. But what it could put an end to, as you say, once we abolish capitalism and when planned harmoniously and rationally and democratically, is exploitation, is drudgery, is work that is frankly beneath humanity. This is the point. And in the absence of a revolutionary perspective, Suskin can only um, come up with a dystopian conclusion. But we're not saying that human beings would be idle um, under under a socialist or communist society which, through economic planning and rational use of automation, had done away with these boring and dangerous tasks, are we? No, of course not. I mean, under such a society, uh, people would really be able to be fully develop themselves in a human way, uh, not to chase after something because they think there's a gap in the market for it, or there's a, uh, you know, that that's where there's more, happens to be more work at the moment, but to really do what they want to do or what they think society would benefit from to really develop themselves and to do it in a way um for its own sake like not to do it not to sort of distort your work uh because of course even today under capitalism some people obviously do do work that they enjoy or they they do work they think improves society but even then the way in which you do it is not really dictated by the actual needs it's dictated by the market it's dictated by economic pressures um it's dictated by your boss but in this situation, it would really mean actually doing the work as it needs to be done, whatever that happens to be. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we can't even, we cannot even fathom the sort of, with the, especially with the use of AI technology, which would not just be used for planning the economy. It would be used as an aid in creativity. Um, stri I strictly say it as an aid, it's subordinate to our own creative desires, of course. But as an aid to, to our creativity, we just, we can't imagine the kind of heights that we would scale to. Mm -hmm. Um, and also the, the way in which when we open up this, this possibility, not just to that thin, thin layer of society that at the moment really can live a bit like that under capitalism, but actually to everybody mm -hmm. to, to, and not just everybody in the advanced capitalist countries, but everybody in the entire world. Mm -hmm. And then we all learn from that. Um, and learn from one another in a human way, not a, a, with a sort of disappearance of the of the need for sort of privilege and status and, and all of these sort of humiliating insecurities that we have. Why do we have them? Because we live in a society of, of insecurity and uncertainty where none of us feel looked after, where none of us feel really part of, of society properly. Um, uh, we feel like society is a, is a hostile force, really. We have to sort of fight to find our place in it. When that's gone and when we have the time to develop ourselves and we want to help society because society is something that nurtures us, uh, yeah, the, 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 the culture that we will create, the ideas that we will come up with will be, yeah, we can't really imagine those. And I, I wouldn't want to try to anticipate that. And there's no reason to believe that that isn't possible. There's mm. nothing... There's nothing technically impossible about it. We've got the technology to realize this even now, you know, and there's nothing in human nature that is inherently nasty and, 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 and greedy and uh, malicious at all. There's nothing. Do we have that capacity? Of course. Uh, but we, there's nothing, uh, it's, we don't want to do that for just because for the sake of it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think the, the possibilities the AI helps us to realize are absolutely uh, inspiring. But it's again, it's, it's a social problem more than a technological problem. The form of society, the structure of society we have, the mode of production, the class who controls our economy, really, that has to be done away with. That has to be fundamentally changed because you cannot realize any of this stuff under this economic system. It's completely against the interests of the ruling class. Um, and our society is an inherently short-sighted society. It's, it's just not possible under capitalism. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's all the more important that we build a revolutionary organization capable of taking the fight to this rotten system and leading the working class ultimately to victory over it and 
overthrowing capitalism and laying the basis for a socialist and then a communist society. And we are preparing for the launch of the Revolutionary Communist International, which is the embryo of that organization. Um, as ever, links in the description to where you can sign up for the founding conference of the RCI uh, on the 10th of June. We're promoting the run-up to the RCI all over the international. If you go onto our social media pages, onto marxist.com, you can see how the comrades are mobilizing in one country after another, in Denmark, in France, in Germany. Just got back from the Congress of our Belgian comrades, and I promised that I'd shout them out. So, uh, hello. Uh, bonjour. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Looking forward to seeing you guys at the RCI conference in June. Daniel, that was great. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. And we'll see you all next week for a new episode. All right. Solidarity. <laughs>